There are many things in life where form follows function. And this is the latest addition to that category, the McLaren Senna. Like I suspect most of you, until now I've been an intrigued spectator to the McLaren Senna. I saw the photographs on the internet and I also saw the reaction to those photographs, which was, it's fair to say, varied. Some people liked it, a lot of people thought it was a very, very ugly car and couldn't understand it at all. I was somewhere in the middle, I was prepared to give it the benefit of the doubt until I could actually see it in the carbon. So what do I think? Now I can see it in three dimensions. Well, it's not pretty, but it's very striking. And it's one of those cars that you really do want to walk around. And the more you see it, the more you notice things on it. And there are some extraordinary shapes and voids in this car. Spaces that I don't think I've ever seen, certainly on a road car before. It's intriguing. And now, of course, McLaren has given us the numbers the reasons for the way it looks. The easy way to remember the headline figures of this extraordinary car is 800, 800, 800. That's to say 800 PS or 789 brake horsepower, 800 Newton meters or 590 pounds foot of torque, and 800 kilos of downforce, 155 miles an hour. Dry and in its lightest possible spec, the car weighs 1,198 kilos, which McLaren points out is the lightest car it's produced since the F1, although it makes that car's 60 kilos lighter curb weight look even more impressive. Of course, the Senna has a better power to weight ratio, it's 659 brake horsepower per tonne, and from standstill it will hit 62 miles an hour in 2.8 seconds, going on to reach 124 miles an hour in 6.8 seconds and 186 miles an hour in 17.5 seconds. That's 300 kilometers an hour and the amount of time it took to say that last sentence. The standing quarter is over in 9.9 .9 seconds and flat out the Senna will do 211 miles an hour. Of course, if you need to stop in a hurry, then it has that covered too. New carbon ceramic brakes might take seven months to produce, but they will bring the car to a halt from 124 miles an hour in just 100 meters. Impressive stuff. Now, I'm no aerodynamicist, but I'm going to attempt to talk you through some of the reasons for why these shapes are as they are and how the air is being channeled over the car, starting down here. Now, you might remember that other McLarens have had two low temperature radiators at the front situated either side of the nose. This has just got one big one in the centre here. We've also got two nostrils here, which makes it look rather sort of shark-like really, and these generate downforce by guiding the air through the front clamshell. However, the big downforce generator here is this front splitter. It's 150 millimetres more prominent than it is on a P1, 75 millimetres more prominent than it is on a P1 GTR even. They've actually made it so you can replace, remove this front section in case you should clobber or clatter a prominent kerb on a track. You can see these active aero blades in here which work symmetrically on both sides. They channel air up to fixed aero blades further up in the car and actually Although they obviously generate downforce, the reason for them being active is probably more to bleed off some of the aero downforce, such is the effectiveness of this front splitter. They help to keep the car balanced, particularly under braking. Lights, whilst we're here, mention those 21 LEDs in each one, and they are adaptive lights, but whereas usually you'd have motors to move the lights, these are done by reducing the brightness of various LEDs within them to help them point and illuminate in different directions. Obviously the front wheel arches are an area of sort of real sort of high pressure buildup. So the air is forced out of the wheel arches, extracted and taken down here to cool the rear brakes and also to feed the big double diffuser at the rear. However, there's also air being channeled through this section, which looks a little bit reminiscent of the 720S between the wing mirror and this A pillar here. And that then feeds one of the high temperature radiators in the side here. As we move round to the back, it's worth noting that aesthetically, I think it is the rear three-quarter section that really jars and has caused the uproar. The big flat area around the back wheel, although I'm sure aerodynamically efficient, looks like a suit with shoulder pads gone wrong. Anyway, the engine is essentially the 720S's dry sump flat plane crank 4-litre V8 with electrically actuated twin-scroll turbochargers. 
However, it has a new inlet and manifold system, lightweight camshafts and pistons, and requires two fuel pumps. Thus, it's designated the M840TR. Oh, and it's mated to the familiar 7-speed seamless shift dual-clutch gearbox. Thankfully, they've managed to install the 675LT ignition cut technology for sport mode, so you should get those lovely cracks on upshifts. It's hard to know actually where to look first at the back of the car. There is so much going on here. We'll start with these louvers here because a lot of this is about getting heat out of the engine, but crucially, not disrupting the airflow to this massive rear wing. And it is enormous. I mean, if you've seen the rear wing on a P1, you'll have thought, wow, that's, that's pretty big. This is on a whole other level. It looks high because this rear deck is so low as well. It's got these swan supports to keep the airflow clean underneath. There's 25 degrees of movement between full DRS, so low drag mode, and then full high downforce mode. And the whole thing here, 4.87 kilos, that's all it weighs, and yet it can support over 100 times its own weight in downforce. The other thing that instantly catches your eye around the back of the car is the exhaust. The way these three exits here are sort of slashed in line with that rear deck. Titanium and Inconel, it's, it's not the easiest way to exit the exhaust apparently, but it is the way that keeps the airflow the least disrupted from the rear wing and the double diffuser, which if we come down here, this enormous but intricate double diffuser is made of just one single piece of carbon fiber. It's helped by the fact that the car it's actually nine millimeters higher than at the front when it's in its full race mode, giving it a bit of rake and just helping it to then be sucked to the ground. I love the fact as well that if you say in another center following this, you'd be able to see all the mechanical gubbins through the diffuser. Just lovely. At the core of the 750,000 pound center is the carbon mono cage three. McLaren says that its innovative double walled rear crash structure negates the need for an additional roll cage, thereby saving weight. On the suspension front, McLaren has introduced a second generation of race active chassis control, or RCC2 for short. It's complicated, but perhaps the most notable thing is that although there are small, lightweight and relatively soft springs in the suspension, mechanical springs have largely been replaced with a hydraulic circuit. McLaren says that the main benefit of this over a normal system is that it allows variable ride height and variable spring stiffness. Of course, this is where you really want to be in the McLaren Senna in the driving seat. And it's a case of where do you look first? I mean, there are, there are bits that you recognize from other McLarens, but there's so much that is new. Starting with these seats, I mean, as soon as you get into the car, you have to get in past these prominent side sort of bolsters. The seats themselves weigh just eight kilos. And if you take the shells alone, weigh less than four kilos, which is pretty extraordinary. Lots of bare carbon fiber everywhere you look. And that causes this. You move the seat backs and forwards. Buttons are attached to the side of it as well. Talking of buttons, if you look up here, this is where the engine starts, is race. Uh, we've got windows in here as well, fans, locking. There's quite a lot actually going on up there. Then you've got this, which is the active dynamics panel and where you're going to have the um, McLaren telemetry system uh, that you can have and also the, the VDC or variable drift control all up on the screen. But it appears from, from where I'm sitting, it just seems to be floating there, which is very beautiful. We've got the dash, which obviously is in its low track mode here, but also folds up for the road if you want. And it's just, it's sparse, but also very beautiful and really, really interesting. I suppose the other big feature happens when you close the door, pull this down, and you have these optional see-through panels here, which means you'll actually be able to see if you really have hit that apex or not. It's, um, it's a lovely thing and I'm, I really look forward to driving the car and seeing the road rushing by like that. It reminds me a bit of um, uh, the Lotus 340R, although I think those were sort of translucent rather than actually transparent. Talking of that, talking of things you can see from in here, if you look behind, then you can actually see into the engine and that carbon plenum. And of course, sitting here, you'll be able to hear the air rushing in through that intake up there. And that's really what this car is going to be about. We don't know yet what's it going to feel like, what are those responses going to be like, the hydraulically power assisted steering. Is it going to be wriggling with feel? How's that suspension going to work? It's going to be interesting. One thing I hadn't noticed before, so the front wheels and tyres, they're 245 section, which is quite narrow, especially compared to the 315s on the rear. 
So is that going to, you know, are you going to feel a bit of understeer, which we always did in the P1 as well. There's going to also going to be a very F1 or I suppose endurance racing push to drink system for those really long sessions on track. And this car's got the, the camera system. So you've got three cameras which you can overlay with a telemetry just to see how bad you really are on the track. <laughs> Look at that. The exposed gas strut for the door just to save weight. Oh, and the, um, the stereo, optional. Not sure if it really sort of kind of makes sense in a track orientated car, but it weighs just over seven kilos. So it's extremely lightweight. Well done, Bowers and Wilkins. All in all, I just can't wait to drive it now. We've just got to hear it start out and roll out of the pit lane. If you like McLaren and great roads in Scotland, then why not click over there and have a look at our home run video? Or if you just like supercars, then why not watch our short film on the Ferrari 812 Superfast? Oh, and if you've subscribed, then please don't forget to click on the little bell icon to activate notifications.